Today's talk is Imaging of Foreign Bodies in the Musculoskeletal System. And I have no, I have nothing to disclose. The aims of this talk uh, for imaging of foreign bodies in the musculoskeletal system is to discuss the appearance of different types of foreign bodies in the extremities on different modalities, including X-ray, ultrasound, CT, and MRI, to understand some of the pitfalls in imaging interpretation of foreign bodies, and to discuss some of the benefits of employing a multi-modality approach to identifying them if necessary. I first want to briefly talk about the clinical importance of detection of foreign bodies. The foreign body itself may cause a granulomatous response, which can be accompanied by infection, uh, which can sometimes be chronic and can sometimes um, mask the foreign body, make it harder to detect. An indwelling foreign body can also result in tendonitis, synovitis, and osteolitis, osteolysis. And a free or intraarticular foreign body in an extremity can also result in joint pain and joint damage. So generally, removal of a foreign body in the extremities is advocated within 24 hours, especially for uh, wood and glass. And then we'll discuss some of this more in greater detail later. First, let's start with x-ray. X-ray is a useful initial imaging modality because of its uh, availability and relatively low radiation exposure. It has a high sensitivity and specificity for dense foreign bodies. It has a lower sensitivity and specificity for less dense foreign bodies, such as wood, uh, which we'll talk about in a bit. And if a foreign body is very small, even if it is normally dense, uh, such as glass, but, but is suspected to measure less than a millimeter, it may not be visible, and so other modalities may be useful for further imaging. Let's first talk about opaque versus non-opaque materials. The appearance on X-ray is based on the density of the material compared to the adjacent soft tissues, as we know. Um, and glass, as I mentioned before, can be difficult to detect if the fragments are small. It's important to note, if you look at this little diagram, under opaque materials, it's important to know that glass of all types can be opaque. Um, there was a belief at one point that only objects, only glass, excuse me, that contained lead was visible on x-ray, but that is not true. Glass of all types, all, all types can be visible. And I'll let you read through the list uh, yourself as far as what constitutes an opaque material. Uh, just briefly though, obviously most metallic objects with the exception of aluminum, most bone uh, material, and also some medications and poisons, and there's a handy mnemonic chipes that helps uh, to remember which those are. Non-opaque materials include most foods and medicines, most fish bones actually, and wood, splinters and thorns, plastics. I wanna show a couple of cases of radiolucent foreign bodies on x-ray. So in this case, we have an image of a, of a uh, foot. And I think if those yellow arrows were not present to point out the subtle area of lucency that probably most of us would not appreciate that there is a foreign body in this patient with a history of stepping on a wooden stick. It may just look like gas, or even just fat, and we may not notice this. So something to be aware of. Second case, similar situation. In this 
case, it, uh, there was a history of assault with a wooden stake. And again, without these arrows pointing to it, I think it would be difficult for a lot of us to identify this vertically oriented lucency in the soft tissues here in the calf. And in contrast to that, this patient stepped on a needle, which is very readily visible in the plantar soft tissues of the hind foot. This is an interesting case um, of an injected mercury uh, in the antecubital region in the soft tissues. And so this is just demonstrating how radio dense mercury can be. Moving on to ultrasound. Ultrasound is can be an optional, excuse me, optimal uh, imaging modality in the emergency setting. Uh, just as x-ray can be, ultrasound has a high sensitivity and specificity, um, usually it's easy, easily accessible. It's recommended that a 7.5 megahertz linear array is used for the extremities. The appearance of a wooden form body is hyperechoic with a clean posterior acoustic shadowing versus more um, dense materials such as bullets, glass, and plastic, which are still hyperechoic but may have a dirty posterior acoustic shadowing appearance. Sometimes you will identify a hypoechoic hypervascular ring, which is indicative of surrounding inflammatory changes or granulation tissue. Reverberation artifact can be seen if there's gas accompanying the surrounding inflammatory changes or granulation tissue. And sometimes you can evaluate um, for abscess and vascular and tendon injuries with ultrasound that may accompany a foreign body. So here's an example, patient stepped on a wooden stick. You can see the hyperechoic linear foreign body and relatively clean posterior acoustic shadowing. Another case, uh, this patient had a mesquite thorn in the subcutaneous tissues. It is, this is a rather noisy image, so apologies for that, but you can see the hyperechoic thorn and some dirty posterior acoustic shadowing. Briefly, we can talk about CT, uh, which is which can be useful for localization of foreign bodies um, if it is invisible on X-ray, or if there's a question of uh, infection or joint injury associated with the foreign body. CT can be useful to localize the foreign body in, in uh, three dimensions, which may be a little limited on X-ray, depending on how many views you have. It's recommended that a wide window setting is used um, for wood as it is going to appear lucent on the soft tissue window just as it would on x-ray. Uh, interestingly, a wooden foreign body that is chronic can absorb water and become more dense in appearance on X-ray and CT, so a little bit of a, a pitfall in, in imaging. It doesn't really follow the rules. If it becomes chronic, it becomes dense rather than lucent. CT may be able to be, uh, may be able to demonstrate the osseous changes in response to foreign body, such as lysis or periostral reaction compared to X-ray. And it can better demonstrate soft tissue reactions around the foreign body Drawbacks, of course, for a CT include increased cost and radiation exposure to the patient. I have one example of CT. Here, this patient had a stone foreign body. We have the X-ray here to the left with a radio dense object in the subcutaneous tissues of the medial aspect of the knee, which 
you can readily see here on CT and localize in three dimensions. I want to spend a little bit of time on MRI. MRI obviously is not usually the first line imaging modality for foreign bodies, and it can be limited in the detection of glass, plastic, and wood, but it can be useful for problem solving to assess chronic complicated foreign bodies or a suspected foreign body. You may receive a history, say you have an MRI of a foot with a history of a chronic soft tissue infection with drainage, a mass hematoma, or even a suspected tumor, soft tissue neoplasm. It's always important to uh, have a level of suspicion for foreign body when you get a case like that, because incidental detection of a foreign body is not uncommon. Most foreign bodies appear low, have a low signal intensity on MRI. On all, on all sequences. Secondary signs of a metallic artifact or a fibrous surrounding T2 hypo intense wall can be helpful. And if there is a known history of suspected foreign body, it, it is important to screen with X ray or CT before MRI is performed. Also, the MRI scout image should be interrogated for the presence of foreign bodies. We won't deeply dive into the physics of this, but I just want to remind us of what constitutes a paramagnetic versus a diamagnetic versus a ferromagnetic material. Paramagnetic materials are comprised of unpaired electrons. There's an alignment in the direction of the main magnetic field which gets amplified um, in the case of gadolinium and air, for example. Diamagnetic materials have no intrinsic, and no intrinsic atomic magnetic moment, and these align opposite to the main magnetic field and reduce it, such as in the case of muscle, fat, water, and calcium. Ferromagnetic materials have an extreme positive magnetic susceptibility, such as in the case of iron or nickel. And these materials result in the susceptibility artifact, which we're all familiar with, where there's a profound signal loss and an amplification of the size of the object or the lesion. So here's an example of an MRI of a thumb and you can see susceptibility artifact here. It looks like, oh, there, there must be a large, a large foreign body here or something causing susceptibility artifact. And this is very deceiving. We're all familiar with this, I think, how surprising it is. And here's the corresponding X-ray where, I don't even know if you can see this, but I'll point it out. There's a very, very tiny, maybe less than one millimeter radio density here, and it may be metallic, accounting for that artifact. I'm just gonna go through a few cases now demonstrating uh, foreign bodies in MRI. Here's a patient who stepped on a wooden stick. You can see the low signal intensity linear foreign body in the subcutaneous tissues with surrounding edema. This patient had a stingray injury and we have an axial image here with a skin marker overlying the volar aspect of the wrist and anterior to the flexor retinaculum. We have a linear low signal intensity form body, which is the stingray barb. Same case, just coronal image demonstrating the barb here. And the post-contrast axial image showed that this form body was um, associated with a horseshoe abscess here in the region of the uh, extensor retinaculum surrounding the, excuse me, flexor, uh, surrounding the flexor tendons. 
demonstrating the benefits of using MRI in that you can see lots of secondary uh, ramifications of an indwelling foreign body. And this third case, just want to illustrate uh, pre and post contrast images. You can see the, the foreign body, uh, linear low signal intensity foreign body pointed out by the red arrows here with surrounding enhancement. And you can imagine that if there you know, was an unknown history of foreign body in this area, this could be interpreted as a soft tissue mass, for example. So important to have a high level of suspicion in the extremities for possible foreign body with that sort of history. I want to briefly touch upon the management of foreign bodies. Metallic foreign bodies, uh, the majority of these can be treated conservatively as uh, they tend to be encapsulated and inert. If they are lead containing, such as bullet fragments, they may possibly fragment within the joint space, which can lead to synovitis, a destructive inflammatory arthritis, chondrolysis, or a secondary uh, degenerative changes. There is a an appearance that's been referred to as a lead arthrogram, which I'll show you in a second. One consequence of a indwelling a lead containing foreign body is systemic lead toxicity. Here is uh, an example of a quote lead arthrogram, an x ray of an elbow demonstrating hyperdense lead material around the joint space. Glass can be one of the most irritating foreign body substances. Um, my next bullet point, I should explain a little more clearly. 53% um, of malpractice claims related to retained foreign bodies, um, basically the number of malpractice claims in the extremities can be related to foreign bodies uh, to a relatively high degree. It's important to remind providers that glass form bodies that, again, as we stated earlier, that do or do not contain lead can be detected radiographically. And that um, complications from retained glass form bodies can certainly um, affect the neurologic vascular or tendinous structures. And there can be delayed migration hazards associated with tissue dissection. With wood foreign bodies, there's a risk of inflammation or infection. Ultrasound is encouraged as a useful first line imaging modality. Again, we demonstrated earlier that on ultrasound, there's a hyperechoic appearance with posterior acoustic shadowing. Um, just a reminder of the, of the imaging appearance on CT, these appear to have an air density and you may see on gradient echo MRI susceptibility artifact. Um, associated with gas in the foreign body, and so MRI is relatively insensitive. So ultrasound, again, would be the useful uh, first modality. And again, a reminder about the dense appearance on CT over time after fluid absorption into the wooden foreign body. Wanted to take this one slide to talk about ultrasound hydrodissection, which is a procedure where local anesthetic can be injected around a foreign body to loosen it and help aid its removal. In these images here, um, the foreign body is delineated by the arrow head. The arrow is the needle that's injecting um, anesthetic both um, posterior to and anterior to the foreign body to help loosen it and bring it near to the surface. Fluoroscopy can be used in conjunction with ultrasound as well to help remove foreign bodies. So I put together a little uh, decision tree here for working up 
musculoskeletal foreign bodies. So if there's a clinical history of foreign body, the answer is yes, but the x-ray is negative. Consider ultrasound. If there's a clinical history of, if there is no clinical history of foreign body, but there is a foreign body granuloma that is suspected on CT or MRI, but you're not sure whether or not you can, you can see the foreign body, again, ultrasound. So all roads tend to lead to ultrasound. Definitely rely on, on that if all else uh, fails for the diagnosis on other modalities. So in conclusion, imaging can play a vital role in detection, classifying, and removal of foreign bodies in the musculoskeletal system. Understanding the best imaging modality for detection is important. And remember to have a high level of suspicion uh, for a foreign body. Double check, um, look at all of your imaging planes that should help um, to identify a foreign body. Thank you.